The purpose of Free Thought Forum is to be vigilant to the encroachment of religion into government and to educate the general public as to what a free thinker is. My thoughts give me power. No scholar can map them. No hunter can trap them. No person can deny. No person can deny. I think as I please. Hello, my name is Hugh Henry. This is Free Thought Forum. We're here to talk about viewing Islam and Muslims in America with uh, Nazil Siddiqui. Nazli Siddiqui. Nazli Siddiqui. Uh, she's going to have to help me with that. Nazli Siddiqui um, is a San Antonio freelance writer and professional with a background in staffing industry. She's born in Karachi, Pakistan, acquired a master's degree in journalism from the University of Karachi. She began her journalistic career in Karachi as the editor of a scientific research journal while contributing articles on social issues to various publications. She later worked as an advertising copywriter for print and broadcast media, came to the United States in 1984. Previously a professional resume writer and employment consultant in New York and then in San Antonio, currently managing operations of a local staffing company. At the present time, she feels the need for addressing the issues of Islam and Muslims in America and also handles subjects relating to the geopolitics of South Asia. She's married and a mother of two teenage children, and welcome to our program. Thank you, Henry. Um, would you like to begin on what you're... Sure. Um, I feel I would like to begin by saying that faith for each person um, is the search for truth. Mm -hmm. It's a little different than religious teachings and practices. I think religious teachings and practices for each organized religion is a vehicle to take people towards the source. Um, faith, however, is the hope of finding the source. And um, to me, it is the sense of purpose. It is the essence of goodness and fairness within each person. And that's where I stand as a Muslim in America. I feel that Muslims are like any other group that lives in this free society. Uh, some of them have immigrated into the United States from other countries. Uh, to live as free individuals in this free society, and they are here because they like the ideals of freedom and justice in the society. Some of them have embraced Islam, um, not previously born as Muslims. Mm -hmm and they too share the same beliefs. So I think this is a group that has been grossly misunderstood, especially in the post 9-11 era. And uh, my effort and my job, I feel, is to, like most of my other um, brothers and sisters in my community, is to reach out and say that we are here to talk. So please talk to us. Um. I'll probably get shot by my friends in the atheist community, but I've always held that I'm an atheist by faith, and I would agree with your description of faith, but I could have trouble getting out of here today. <laughs> um, I, I think that, uh, uh, well, describe uh, Islam for us, please. Henry, Islam is not a theocracy in isolation. I know that you are an atheist by belief, by your belief system, but just for education purposes. Um, Islam is a continuation of the monotheistic tradition um, that have been preached by the biblical prophets, uh, starting from, from Noah to Abraham to Moses to Jesus, and then uh, sealed, like we believe, by Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. I know that Muslims consider uh, Jesus to be a prophet, and their yes, name for do. him is Yeshua. The name for Jesus in Islam, uh, in the, the Arabic scripture, is, um, it's not Yeshua. Yeshua is the, uh, oh. it, it is the uh, Jewish version 
Okay. Um, or the Hebrew name. Uh, in Arabic, it's Isa. Okay. I've never heard that. Isa. Mm -hmm. And many Muslims are named Isa, too. Huh. Um, uh, and the Quran? Quran is the revelation that was brought to Prophet Muhammad uh, through the visitations of Archangel Gabriel. Uh, these visitations lasted about 27 years of his lifetime. He got visited by him and he revealed the word of God, which were preserved and later put in print. And the book Quran is, uh, in my best opinion, it is a collection of if it's a collection of divine sermons, mm -hmm. um, which gives the guidance to its followers. Well, I understand that Muslims believe that in heaven there is a book, Al-Kitab. That's true. Which um, is the, the source of faith for all religions, and that in the case of Muhammad, the angel actually wrote that book in Arabic upon his heart and then asked him to recite it. And the Quran means recitation. Quran means recitation or reading. That's correct. Muslims believe that there is the, the book, the mother of all books, yeah. that is uh, preserved in the in the heaven. And, and when they speak of Christians or Jews as people of the book, right? They're talking about that book. They're not talking about the Bible. They are talking about the derivations from that book that came in form of. Uh, the Psalms of David or the Torah revealed uh, to Moses or or the Gospels given mm -hmm. to Jesus and then mm -hmm. the Quran given to Muhammad. Mm -hmm. um. and, and it is believed that all of those are true books, uh, all of those are words of God, and uh, none of them um, negate each other. Well, this is a question you've given me, but it's actually a statement. Islam is at odds with the West, although I'm not sure whose choice that is. Um, I think it's partly a Western choice and partly a minority of Islam's choice. It is a, a misconception, which is, of course, it, it's bounced around. An idea is bounced around, and then the idea is bought, and it's built upon, and it's crystallized in our minds. And that's what it is. I do not believe that Islam is at odds with the West or this is a clash of Islamic civilization with the Western civilizations, none of that. I really believe what's happening today is a lot of politics. It has a lot of political background and it has, um, it has to do with the grievances that have accumulated in the hearts and minds of people over over the decades of what they feel are unjust policies uh, followed by the United States. And I think a lot of it can be resolved um, by correction of these policies and to begin with by engaging in a dialogue. That's where things will begin, uh, engaging in a widespread uh, dialogue within America and with the international community. Well, by organizing forums to that effect. Western civilization owes a huge amount to Islamic civilization. Um, there is so much. Uh, for example, our mathematics. The uh, Arabic word for the is al. So you right. have algebra, algebra, mm -hmm. uh, which might not make you popular in high school, if I took, bring that up. <laughs> uh, but there was so much from Islamic civilization that actually started, that lit the fire under Western civilization and brought about the Renaissance, uh, it, the Islamic people had preserved, translated and preserved all of the ancient books that they could from the Greeks. And if it wasn't for them, we would have nothing by Plato or, or Socrates or, or Plato or, or Aristotle. Uh -huh. um, they brought us the, the, num the number zero from India came in. Um, they brought us so much, and yet that that's never acknowledged. It's never acknowledged in, in really in Western history. It's not acknowledged because um, Muslims have not emerged in this era to claim it. 
And unless you claim it and you face the challenge, you're not going to get the rewards. It's like, wait a minute, guys, where'd you right. think this came from? <laughs> right, and uh, nobody's going to, to extend it on a silver platter for you, so you have to emerge uh, to the level where you are performing and you are claiming uh, the, what, you, uh, what you've sowed in the past. Well, the, the reason for the, the, the current conflict, flat out now, is, of course, terrorism. Mm -hmm. And what do you and the, the Muslim community think is the best way uh, to deal with terrorism? I, I think the best way I would begin to answer that question is to say that I feel America has a right to defend itself. It has a right to defend its borders, has a right to defend its people, and America has all the right to defend its interests. Let me interrupt you here for a second. In the Quran, when it talks about jihad, it is usually talking about exactly that right, the right to defend yourself against another's aggression. Jihad can be described in two different ways, and yeah. it's a very touchy subject, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I don't ha mind, I, I have no hesitation discussing it, um, which I will probably touch upon once I've answered your question regarding terrorism. Um, but I, like, I begin by saying that Yes, America should defend itself, um, but there is no foolproof method. I think there's no quick fix to that. Um, while um, enhancing the security measures, we have to also start addressing what the root causes are, and what the problems are that precipitate uh, terrorism, where it comes from. And I think it's not a, it's not a defeat of ideology if you would stop for a minute and take stock of things and see what you've done which has been wrong in the past. But coming back to the issue of jihad, uh, I would describe jihad in two different ways. Yeah, uh, I, I erred. I know there's a second definition. I'm sorry. Right. Jihad uh, is, uh, jihad simply means struggle, um, struggle against any kind of wrongdoing. Uh, it is also a struggle against your own follies and, and your own temptations. Um, it is also the right to defend yourself uh, in the face of an outside attack mm -hmm. um, against oppression. Uh, and jihad is a concept that has been grossly misinterpreted misinter by some Muslims as well as uh, non-Muslims. Well, uh, coming from a, a Christian history, which I know well, um, it would be easy for Christians to make the mistake and think it's a holy war because Christianity again and again has engaged in holy war against mm -hmm. others and against itself in its history. And they would make that mistake. They're prone to. Now, there's a recent fatwa issued by Muslim scholars. Yes. Um, talk about that, please. There is a Fiqh Council of North America uh, which in involves scholars. Now, fiqh is, uh, it is a um, issue of Islam where scholars who are very knowledgeable and who have acquired a certain level of knowledge uh, can confer to um, issue uh, new degrees or religious edicts in face of new challenges. And that's what uh, this council has done. They have issued the fatwa or the religious edict stating that terrorism is forbidden in Islam. The term is haram, which means it's strictly forbidden, and anybody who follows it or supports it uh, is a criminal, not a hero or a martyr. Now, I'd like to explain um, to people that the organization here within Islam this is not comparable to, say, the Catholic Church with the Pope issuing a bull, in that the Pope has um, this religious uh, authority passed I through agree. ceremony, etc., onto him. In Islam, particularly Sunni Islam, um, scholars look at the Quran, they look at the sayings of the Prophet, the they hadith. look at the, the behavior of his community, all of which was documented around 1000 AD and put together. And when they have to deal with a problem that isn't directly addressed there, then the scholars will issue this, and Muslims are free 
to either agree or disagree. I agree with that. And this is the loose, se loose central organization within Islam. And I would even say the lack of central organization within Islam that is good and bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's good because it allows, it affords freedom to the individuals to, to either accept or reject what is being issued by the scholars and the opinion leaders. It is bad because then sometimes it becomes chaotic. Now, I... in, in this respect, I'm, um, I just wanted to add that in, in this respect, I think this fatwa or religious decree is getting a lot of support because it has been backed by 130 organizations, institutions, leaders, and um, the mosques. Um, well, this, this is how uh, something like this gets more accepted, is if right. more respected people say, look, this is, right. this is the case. Now, I excluded Shiite Muslim because for, for them, uh, the people who would issue this do have a certain religious aura to them and are thought to be, to a certain extent, uh, speaking mm -hmm. as the Prophet spoke. Uh, not nearly as authoritatively, but somewhere halfway in between. Um, so that's the, the technical difference here. Fortunately, in America, Muslims are not, uh, they are not divided in, in terms of Sunnis and Shias. And they converge at the same mosques and pray together, confer together. So I think this uh, religious decree has a lot of popular support. And it's going to go a long way in mobilizing the masses. Um, what do you think the role of the media should be in post 9-11 with respect to the um, Islamic community? The role of media unfortunately has been less than perfect in the post 9-11 era. I feel that media has sensationalized and made business out of this very stark tragedy and instead of healing the wounds, they have created this wedge between American Muslims and the rest of America, which has not come to anybody's benefit. I think the role of media should have been presenting a balanced view of what's going on and what the reality is and getting opinions from all sides involved in this conflict. Well, what many people don't realize is the tradition of American media is the tradition of entertainment. Um, there was a, a period in the Second World War mm -hmm. and shortly after where this idea of journalism and balanced view came into effect. But really, historically, the media, the news and so forth, has always really been there for entertainment. And it's simply getting back right. to its usual business. And people don't realize that. They're still thinking mm -hmm. of, of journalism and balance and truth-telling. And that's just not what American media did for most of its history. Unfortunately, American, most American people don't realize that, but people internationally are aware of that. And that is why American media, um, allow me to say that, uh, is not as respected as British Broadcasting Corporation, which uh, BBC people feel presents the balanced view, uh, is more, uh, more of objective and legitimate media than uh, most American news networks. I've caught them off the base, too. They, um, they have no understanding uh, for a long time of the protests against the, the, uh, the internationalization, the international treaties, the North American free trade, and, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. They simply have no understanding and presented no balanced view of that at all. But also, uh, in other countries, people don't read one paper. That's true. They will read, the, the, for instance, the London Times and the London Guardian and mm -hmm. get both halves of it and know that they're getting a biased view from each half. And it's right. the kind of thing they expect. We're not used to that in the United States, and I'm as guilty as anybody else. I just read the San Antonio Current. I never read the Express News. Um, what do you think about the Iraq War? And I'm sure, knowing the people in this world, room, it, it can't be worse than what we think. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's worse, but I think I'm going to resound what, what you feel. I think Iraq war is the most senseless war of our present history. Yeah, I'll go along with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, the reasons given for this war, uh, the justifications, 
have been baseless. Um, you talk of, we talked about weapons of mass destruction. They were which not found, there. which were not there. And I don't know if we believed to begin with if they were not there or we were incompetent and didn't know. But those, those were not there. Saddam Hussein, as inept as he was, he, I believe he could have been easily taken down by some political maneuvers, so a war was not necessary. Establishment of democracy, and I don't buy that one at all, because that's not what we are doing at all on the international level. And who are we to say what form of government and what form of democracy is good for what people? It's up to the people to decide. I think this has been a senseless war that has caused more destruction than any of the wars or any conflicts in the past I on think, both sides. I think you don't give enough credit for the crusading idea of, that frequently shows up in the Christian West. Um, I think one of the major drivers for this war is a very arrogant notion that if we established a free market democracy in Iraq, and I think this is still a notion, mm -hmm. that it would spread by contagion because it's so obviously a superior uh, idea and infect Afghanistan, Syria, and all the neighboring countries and solve all our problems. When this problem was presented to the State Department, of course the State Department uses very diplomatic language, so they couldn't say, are you guys on drugs or what? Mm -hmm. But they did say, look, even if you got a democracy there, there's no guarantee at all that after you got it there, it would have any liking for America whatsoever. And that's exactly what, what it has turned out to be. And we actually disposed of a democracy in Iran under those circumstances in the 1950s. We had a democracy, they didn't like us, we didn't like them, so we replaced them with a king. Right, that's amazing, yes. And we support other kings and monarchs, so what was so unique about Iraq? Well, it, we could say that the, this first Gulf War, with respect to Kuwait, was to make the world safe for kingdoms, which Kuwait remains. Mm -hmm. I think so. so. Now, you, go ahead. No, I, I really feel that it, we are stuck in Iraq now. We are stuck oh, yeah. in Iraq. And, uh, I noticed that um, you're talking about we being stuck in Iraq, not you being stuck in Iraq. Because, of course, you're here in America, and you're us. You're not them. I speak, when I, I speak as an American, and then I speak as a Muslim, and sometimes I speak as a woman, so <laughs> I'm a lot of people. Um, you've said, uh, I believe I have it as the quote at the end of the program, victory in the war against terror could not be achieved without Muslims on board. Could you talk about that? I very firmly believe in that, and that's an area that has not been utilized by America. A source which is the American Muslims or Muslims all over the world. If you look at the model of the response that came from the July London bombings, you'll see that that's exactly what Tony Blair did. I'm no great fan of his, but he did a great job, I think, and uh, credit is, should be given where it's due. Uh, what Tony Blair did was he immediately connected with the Muslim community and brought them in uh, to find out the best response that could be given to this problem. And I think um, he realized that the Muslims face the same threat that the rest of the society faces in, at the hand of the terrorists. Well, not only the terrorists themselves in their acts of killing, but their, even their ideology is in fact a threat to Islam and the Islamic community. It is a very big threat. It's as big of a threat to Islam as it is to America or the West. Because this is converting your religion into something right. that's never been before. It's never been before. And, and we has no desire to go. <laughs> we have no desire to go that route, and we are concerned for us and for our future generations. And we would definitely like to save our faith and our community from that threat, that menace that's called terrorism. I know one issue with um, my friends here in the atheist community is women in Islam. And I know there's an awful lot of misinformation about that because I know about uh, the prophet and his first and second wives. Mm -hmm. And I know about the times when there, instead of a caliph, caliph there was a begum in Baghdad. Um, 
Could you talk about women in Islam? It's a very touchy subject because most people would not want to believe what, what I'm going to say. But I think Islam is the, is the only or probably the first religion that gave rights to the women in the scripture. Uh, I'm not talking about rights of the women as they acquired it through their struggles or suffrage movements or, or other um, feministic movements. I'm talking about rights in the scripture. A woman was given the right to inheritance. She, ha she was given right to um, witness, bearing witness in the court. Uh, she was given a lot of rights within the family and within the community. Um, now, what you see in the Muslim societies is certainly not um, an example of what Islam um, gives to the women or what Islam has suggested uh, as a lifestyle for the women. No, it's what's it's the tradition that was there before Islam came, right? And, unfortunately, and it's a struggle to change it. Right. And you've been working at it for you know a thousand years, and it, you right. still can't get it budged sometimes. That's true. And also, uh, if you see the problems of some of the Muslim countries, and I don't call them Islamic countries, I call them Muslim countries because I feel these two terms are not interrelated. No, they're not. Um, so the situation of the problems of women in some of the Muslim countries are similar to the problems of the other traditional societies in the East. Um, yeah. India has done a lot of struggle. The Indian women have gone through a lot of... They go through death. <laughs> they go through death and burnings and um, yeah. whatnot. Um, as opposed to, let me cut in here, as opposed to Islam in Indonesia, where if you looked at the rights of women there, Right. You know, it looks nothing like what it looks like, for instance, in, in uh, parts of the Arab world. That's true. So it's, it's really the culture and the traditions that, uh, that are witnessed today, the way women are treated in the societies. Um, women in China had to go through a lot of struggles. Yeah, the broken feet and so forth. Right. So it, it depends on how traditional the society is, and if the society is a feudal society, uh, then the feudal system has its own way of subjugating people, including women. Well, women's rights here really didn't come into existence until the previous 200 years. And uh, uh, it was a real struggle 100 years ago to get the women's right to vote. Well, thank you very much for being on our program. Thank you for having me. I hope thank I've you. given you an opportunity, um, small as it is on a public television show, that, that you know people kind of tune across. But you, I feel that the Muslim community can use all the help it can get in, in a time like this. I certainly appreciate all the help that have been given to us uh, by you. And I think I've made the best use of it, this opportunity, I hope. I think you have. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is Hugh Henry for Free Thought Forum. Um, tune in again sometime. Uh, we have more things to talk about. Thank you very much. I think as I please. And this gives me pleasure My conscience decrees This right I must treasure My thoughts will not cater To duke or dictator No person can deny Decadence in free